Good morning, everyone, and thanks so much for being with us. I am very excited to be joined by Dr. Ahmed Shahid, who is a friend and somebody that I've gotten to know since he became the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief uh, for the United Nations. Ahmed is just got such an outstanding background and is someone with so much just expertise, but a unique perspective in this field. Uh, good morning, Gina. Thank you so much for having me on. Really looking forward to having this conversation with you today. Well, so let me give a little bit of background. Um, Dr. Shahid is actually at my alma mater. He is the deputy director of the Human Rights Center at the University of Essex, where I did my master's in human rights. So he's with a lot of people that I studied under there. And he was also uh, the minister of foreign affairs um, in the Republic of the Maldives. And he's from the Maldives, uh, which he did a lot on human rights issues there. And unfortunately, uh, when he originally got his post to be the Special Rapporteur in Freedom of Religion or Belief, he was actually in exile from the Maldives. And if I'm correct, it was actually the Western countries that nominated you to that, to that position because the Maldives wouldn't have. Is that, is that correct? Well, at that point, uh, the Maldives supported, it was still the good government there. Uh, but then shortly after, a few months after I took on the mandate, there was a coup. And then, you know, I, I had to flee the country because of that. It's just amazing. I don't, I mean, you've literally experienced the issues that you talk about and fight for every day. So I guess let's just get right into it. Tell me a little bit about, because for most people don't, don't know about your background and your story. So can you share a little bit about having come from the Maldives, what, um, what that was like and how that really has given you a passion for working on these issues at the United Nations? Well, you know, the Maldives calls itself a 100% Muslim country, and that itself explains part of the problem, which means, you know, lack of respect for diversity, and also lack of awareness of, of diversity. But then over time, this became even a bigger problem, because uh, from the 70s, 80s onwards, we had more influx of, I feel like, you know, Gulf-funded uh, religious preachers who brought in a far less tolerant version of Islam than the Maldives had been accustomed to. And then over time, you know, the kind of nationalism based on religion that grew in the country uh, really, you know, welded into the authoritarian system. And it's had been challenged by, you know, young people growing in the country. And we did manage uh, to bring about change by working on human rights, by working on grassroots mobilization, by building democratic, if you like, you know, support for democracy. And then therefore we had, um, uh, you know, a regime change as it were uh, around 2008. But again, of course, you know, despite massive progress, um, there was a pushback by the old guard and there was a coup in 2011, uh, 12 rather. And then when, when I left the country, it was in that situation. Of course, we, we've still remained very fragile. We've kind of gone back to democracy, but still, still remain very fragile with regard to institutions still being rather nascent um, and need, in need of development. But the progress on human rights, I think remains, uh, remain, uh, re remains intact and certainly a platform to, to build on. And that experience in the Maldives, both pushing for change, working with change, experiencing the pushback, all of that I feel like gave me exposure in practice as to what works, what doesn't work, what pitfalls to watch out for, what kinds of things best work in different contexts, and use that insight, those insights in my work at the international stage, you know, both as the reporter on Iran, again, a Muslim majority state, of course, the current mandate, where, of course, you know, um, all of the Muslim majority states are, are, are countries with whom I have to engage very closely with. Well, I think that that's amazing because rarely do we have leaders that have that have experienced the things that they have to then fight for in so many ways and um, to have gone through it, you know, from autocracy to mm -hmm. to democracy and back and forth it, and to seeing that struggle firsthand is so unique, but when you, you mentioned that it's, it's a hundred percent Muslim country is what they say. And yet there's so much diversity within that. How has that really informed your perspective on, on talking about freedom of religion or belief issues within Muslim majority countries? Well, I think my background from the Maldives uh, is both an advantage and also in some cases a hindrance. But I think for the most part, it has been an advantage because I found that many Muslim majority states various actors within, within, within those states, open up to me in ways perhaps they might not open up to perhaps you know, other uh, you know, interlocutors. Um, because I can speak a language that many of them can relate to. 
And also, mind you that, you know, Islam is as diverse as any other faith. And Muslims come in all sorts of, you know, shapes and, and if you like, you know, orientations. And being able to identify those nuances, being able to speak to a broad range of audiences enables me to, you know, um, work with those who are moderate, you know, those who are moderates and those who are progressive and those who find space within their context to uh, uh, ask for change, you know, argue for change. So in that, in that sense, having a more nuanced understanding is, is an advantage. At the same time, there are those elements within these countries who reject human rights, you know, very vehemently and regard Islam as incompatible with, with human rights, and then look at me from that eyes of suspicion of, of a traitor worse than you know, somebody else. So that, that is, that is a, you know, the, 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 the downside to this. But by and large, I think it's been an advantage coming from a Muslim majority state, because I am able to speak to a much, much wider audience. And I'm also able to demonstrate, um, engage with the reformist groups and demonstrate that you know, they can from their own if you like, you know, symbols and sources also advance to what we are talking about international stage on human rights. Well, I, when I was at, um, when I was working on like in Congress before, and we had an opportunity to put a, a commissioner forward for the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom, I remember uh, people asking if I would like to to do that job, and I said no. I said I think it's far more important that we have uh, somebody that has that's that's a Muslim that can go and speak to countries than myself because they know firsthand how to interact with people of their own faith and and talk about the value of these freedoms even within their own faith within intra faith as well as inter interfaith and so I just think that that's something that we don't often think about but it's so valuable and I would love to hear because I know you've traveled to so many countries. Uh, I think you were in Nigeria, but you've been to many others. I'd like to hear what countries have you been to in this position and what have been some of the conversations you've had and the unique ways that you've been able to talk about, about freedom of religion or belief in those contexts? Before that, Tina, I just mentioned, go back to what you said earlier. You know, one of my programs at Essex University is a module on uh, Islam and human rights. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this module is to really acquaint mostly Muslim students from you know, uh, Middle East and elsewhere, on how their own faith actually contains resources of engaging with human rights mm -hmm. to sort of create the literacy about human rights. And this also applies to when I visit countries of, of Muslim background, say Tunisia was one where I was a couple of years back. Um, that's the only Muslim majority I've, I've been to. Albania doesn't really fall out, for, you know, come down as a Muslim majority, but there's also, of course, a large Muslim population there. I went to Uzbekistan again, you know, we can call it a Muslim majority state. So again, in these contexts, um, you know, those conversations are very, very, very helpful. Beyond that, I've been to, um, you know, Sri Lanka, uh, just a month or two after the devastating, horrendous, you know, bomb attacks two years back. And I'm waiting now to go um, to uh, Tajikistan and, and the Sudan. But beyond these specific, if you like, you know, country visits, I also make a number of other short visits to countries to engage with various communities uh, across these spaces. But interestingly, you know, um, both Tunisia and Uzbekistan, although a Muslim majority, are quite secular oriented states. And, and therefore the conversations are perhaps easier to have, but within both these communities there are also, if you like, you know, um, conservative Muslims who are very keen to approach all politics from their perspective. And again, where there is accessibility to these groups, I think my background helps to engage with them with some knowledge of what they're talking about. And I think from their, from their part, an expectation of empathy from me as what they are saying. So there's an ability to speak, I think, deeper and um, more widely with these communities when I bring that perspective. Yeah, I, I, I think that they probably value so much that somebody understands and, and that you can challenge misperceptions and, and have a vibrant dialogue, which is what you know, pluralism and human rights is all about. So when, when you've been in this role, what kind of challenges have you faced either from the Maldives or from, from uh, you know, other communities? What, what kind of challenges have you experienced in this role? Well, then I think, you know, um, well, there's some common challenges throughout, uh, you know, the world on this mandate. And the most common um, is the, mis are the misconceptions about what freedom 
of religion or belief and what form entails. Because the presumption, you know, people make is that I my mandate is to promote religion, which immediately, uh, you know, um, raise, alarm, raise alarm bells for progressives, feminists, and others who need to push back on very conservative readings of religion. That's that's one. Of course, the other are those who believe that my mandate uh, will, or at least religious freedom, is a right above other rights. And, and therefore, you can invoke this right to the detriment of other human rights. Again, of course, you, you come across gender equality activists who, who are a bit concerned about that. So the first thing is to really clarify the normative con uh, con uh, you know, the framework. Equally important, of course, are those uh, countries with, with anti-blasphemy laws who think that my mandate ought to protect uh, them against insult to religion. Um, so again, to clarify that the mandate is a human right, it protects human beings and their uh, freedoms, not ideas or religions per se. So these kinds of normative you know, confusions um, are, 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 are a huge problem. And of course, um, in uh, some parts of the world, certainly in Muslim majority states for the most part, there is a perception or a suspicion that the mandate is somehow linked to a political agenda or, or a colonial agenda or, or, or whichever. Distrust around the mandate, um, you know, is something that I need to work work on. So these two, these three issues: a distrust of the of the mandate, which linked to some historical distrust they may have of this of this work, the the literacy issues about the content uh, of, of the of of the uh, norm, of the normative framework, and also uh, the the prioritization of this right of other human rights. I beg your pardon, but also the prioritization of this right above other human rights is also primary concern. Wow. So when you, so as you're going to different countries or just in your, in your mandate, what specific challenges have you faced personally? Like have, have you faced any kind of backlash or um, personal, you know, attacks because of your work in this, in this arena? I mean, there, there have been, I think, you know, um, attacks and of, of different of different types, some of it physical threats, others, of course, you know, just, I suppose, you can call it hate speech. But the physical threats were more linked to my work on the Iran mandate. Uh, you know, I, I began before my current mandate working on the, as I said, the Iran mandate. At the time, I was in the Maldives. And there, of course, my work uh, on, on Iran was seen uh, with suspicion, with hatred, and amidst growing, if you like, hatred in the country, Towards human rights and, and secular, uh, if you like, you know, p p people, I I came under attack physically uh, from from these sources. So in the end, I left the country because when the when the coup happened, I realized I would have an even weaker protection than before. So that was one. And also in my time on Iran, Iran actually used my my faith background, as it were, as of as of attacking me. Uh, given the Sunni Shia division, they thought that they could instrumentalize the Sunni Shia suspicion as a way to discredit my work um, on, on Iran. But even now, in my current mandate, you know, when I take on difficult issues, I get various levels of, you know, criticism is fine, but also some, some anger is also fine, but also some attempts to, I think, to incite, I suppose, hatred towards me. And there have been, this has resulted from reports on, say, gender equality, which has been seen by some as, uh, you know, me, me as being a phob phobic person, in other words, framing me as someone who's anti-religion, um, just because I'm arguing that women have an equal right to this freedom as, as men. That's a very basic, you know, very basic norm. But that doesn't go down very well with, with, in some quarters, especially, especially when people feel that, you know, they need to really assert their agenda over, over the rest. My last report on Islamophobia, or anti-Muslim hatred, has also evoked some unlikely responses, um, you know, on the one hand, being labeled as perhaps um, what can be called a uh, um, left or Islamist, um, or Islam or, Islam or leftist, as they perhaps call, call, call it. In other words, a left-wing Muslim eager to bring in a left-wing agenda rather than human rights framework. Or those who have been unhappy because my report on Islamophobia also mentions that you, know, you cannot use anti-blasphemy laws to protect criticism of, of religion or to prevent that from happening. All, all that Muslim majority states also can be Islamophobic. So, you know, I please none as, as such. I just speak, I just speak the human rights framework as I find it. So on, on, on those situations, those um, you know, actors who have serious problems with the human rights framework find difficulty with my work and they may respond to me in 
in very, very gentle ways or in very robust ways, including, of course, ways that can become very threatening. Yeah. Ha have you ever faced accusations of apostasy or, or blasphemy from other others for some of your work? I have actually, you know, in my, again, again, goes back to my work on Iran. And um, when I began that work and when I am arguing for gender equality, when I am criticizing polygamy, when I'm uh, criticizing bans on conversion and so on and so forth, you know, these come, you know, they have been met with criticisms of being anti-Muslim. And of course, also my very vehement stand against the, de the death penalty uh, and, and of course the, the corporal punishments that they meet out there. These have been seen as anti-Muslim agendas on my part. And in, again, in my country, for the most part, I've been accused of apostasy. You know, I'm, I'm frequently accused of apostasy in my own, own country. But in other quarters, it has been less so. Of course, you know, you do get uh, other surreptitious accusations from various quarters, but the known source of such accusations uh, have been largely the Maldives. And of course, in my time on Iran, from some Iranian uh, government-linked actors as well. Have, have you been able to make any progress in, in discussing uh, the importance of freedom of, of religious speech or of speech generally uh, and expression in relation to these apostasy and blasphemy accusations or laws around the world? Like, have, has, have you been able to in any way kind of put a dent in some of the animus and just, you know, the a lot of the support for both apostasy and blasphemy laws. Have you been able to do anything um, using this position to help change the direction of some public opinion to, to help people understand uh, the, you know, the, the, the importance of freedom of speech and expression? Well, I think, it's a, I mean, I would say, if at all, on the marginally, um, but I think what's been most, most effective is not so much the normative pushback, but the practical situations. There are many instances where governments have actually, you know, relented on specific cases. So they seem more eager or more, more willing or more able to uh, release people detained for apostasy and blasphemy than change their, their laws. However, having said that, you know, I've been also arguing for a triaged approach to the subject. So, of course, I'm demanding the repeal of these laws, but I'm also demanding other measures, such as improving the basic rule of law standards improving due process rights standards so that there's a more professional approach to, to the way they handle this, uh, this, these laws. So that's been some up to, you know, uptake on that. There's been more willingness to work in, in, in that space. Also, I think um, given the work I've been doing with you at CHR, the UN Office on Human Rights, uh, Human rights on something called Faith for Rights, which involves bringing together people of all faiths and none and ask them all from their faith perspectives and commitments, Look at how the human rights framework links with their, their beliefs. Of course, in this context, been, I've been able to work with a larger group of, if you like, you know, stakeholders, including Muslim uh, stakeholders, to demonstrate that what we're talking about is not a call for insult in religion. What we're saying is clarifying that insult in religion doesn't justify harming individuals. And of course, you, if you have these blasphemy laws, it they invariably end up harming individuals through through various, you know, vigilante attacks and, and so on. So there have been some. I think improvement in that. And, the, and more recently, the OIC, when they updated, I think sometime back in February or early March, when they updated their the so-called Cairo Declaration on, on Human Rights, they again, of course, brought in uh, um, uh, you know, a, a line to say that freedom of expression, of course, they repeat what's in Article 19, but then they add a line saying that this doesn't include a right uh, to you know, insult religious figures and so on and so forth. Again, I push back on this and, and they try to kind of clarify what, what they meant. So I think there's an understanding that these laws are problematic. They need to be somehow uh, adjusted, but the normative framework still remains you know, uh, difficult to, to move. But the, at the operational level, I think there's been more movement, more individual cases being addressed. But of course, same time, we still see mounting numbers of cases in many countries not just in Muslim majority states, but there are other states which have similar laws such as public order laws or anti-conversion laws to the same effect. So there is this intolerance towards what's different, but also recognition that while the intolerance may be tackled at a later stage, the operational uh, approach to this needs a more, a more robust legal approach. Well, and I was really interested to hear about the course that you're teaching on human rights in Islam at the University of Essex, because uh, it, it, I'm curious to what extent, 
you see an increase in, in literacy on human rights and its compatibility with Islam or you know, the Islamic understanding of human rights as you were explaining it within the Muslim community? Like, do you see that some of the ideas and the things that you've been writing that we're beginning to see uh, more vibrant discussions within um, you know, individuals of, of the Islamic faith? I think there's now more diffusion of progressive reading of Islam than perhaps a decade ago when I started, started my work at Essex University. But invariably, you know, every year I have students at the end of the term tell me, oh, we didn't know those things. Uh, because, you know, oftentimes uh, in many countries, people are fed a diet of very intolerant understanding of, of religion. You know, the schools become a transmission belt of intolerance. And uh, in many ca these cases, many of these countries, um, freedom of expression is cur curtailed, academic freedom is curtailed, and therefore exploration is, is a risk. And they remain they are tied to a very conservative, if you like, you know, indoctrination they've gone through and all this, all this stage. So when they come out and look at these progressive readings, uh, of course, from Muslim scholars, uh, you know, it's, a, it's an eye-opening moment for them. And they then, of course, reinterrogate themselves and what they know and find, of course, all the time, these elements were a part of their faith. It's just that they hadn't thought along those lines. So I think, yes, that's, that's, that's useful. And like I said, you know, uh, my work on faith rights, again, looks at demonstrating that regardless of your faith, you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, whichever, in all these faiths, there is a common concern about, about the individual, about one's welfare, a humanistic core, as it were. And this is the priority concern for, for all these faiths, to make sure that people can live a good life without harming other people. So through these, without the political angle that comes into this, you know, from, from organized religion, I think there, there are avenues uh, opening up. At the same time, you know, um, groups like the Oslo Coalition and others have been working, you know, on this in this space, and they've been doing good work. And I'm supporting some of these activities in places like say Indonesia to again promote literacy on Islam and human rights to demonstrate that even the blasphemy laws have a political provenance in the Muslim context, and therefore they can be pushed back even by remaining faithful to the Islamic, you know, doctrines as, as it were. Well, I, I think it's fascinating, and I think it would be interesting in many of these countries if they actually went back and looked at where a lot of the laws and things came from, it, they'd be fascinated by the legal history there. And it's not always from the religion. It, it's actually, you know, in many cases, it's probably coming from fear or from other, other factors. And so that historical review is so important to better understanding and developing their own localized understanding and context for freedom of religion or belief and so many other human rights. But I um, I appreciate what you shared earlier about putting FORB into a broader context because uh, in many of these countries, when you're talking about, like you were sharing, um, not just apostasy and blasphemy, but dealing with expression laws and uh, other codes and, and issues, all of these laws and issues are intertwined. And so you can't deal with one in isolation, really. Um, so I'd love to hear more about your focus on education, because I know that as within your mandate, mandate within the special rapporteur mandate that you've put a huge focus on education, obviously, you know, being the deputy director of the center there at Essex, and understanding the importance of educating uh, the, the general public to to these ideas is so valuable. So can you tell me a little bit more about, about your work in that area and why you place such a high value on education in this arena? Thank you. Well, in my reports, uh, going back now, I think now 10 years almost, I always stress the importance of you know, two types of education here. One is about diversity education, knowing the other. So that people grow up knowing that they live in a diverse world, there are diverse perspectives, that you know, the tunnel visioning of the individuals is a very dangerous thing. So try to open it up a little bit so to enable them to embrace the diversity of the, of the world or, or life around them. That, that's one. And of course, this, at the same time, there's the issue of, of literacy about their own culture, history, and religion. Because if they do not own their own culture, if they, don't, if they can't interact with it freely, they really don't have agency within, within that. So what education does is, you know, it can open up minds. Um, it can you know, prepare young people to live in a society that's diverse. 
And we can see in many places where this doesn't happen is a problem. In Sri Lanka, you know, um, you know, a, a neighbor to the Maldives, uh, when I went on a country mission two, two years back, you know, they were just looking at reviewing their own school system because they've learned that the pillarized system whereby Buddhist children go to Buddhist schools, uh, Hindu children go to Tamil schools and Muslims go to madrasas and so on and so forth. And they don't actually meet by and large other children, other young people until they finish schooling and they're 18 years old. By the time they've hardened their, if you like, minds about what the other is. So they have very unrealistic, essentialized views of the other, which they may have picked up from stereotypes or from you know, the media. Of course, the, the, the media creates distortions of everybody. So unless you had access to other forms of knowledge about the community, you won't have a nuanced understanding. And nothing better than actually having peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer contact, meeting a person of the, of the other, as it were, you know, dissolves stereotypes immediately or can do very quickly. And I found that when a community is absent, a people harbor more fearsome views about the other than when they are mingling with them. Example would be, of course, the Swiss referendum on the Minaret some, some many years back now. And the survey post the referendum found that in those places where the communities had interactions with Muslims, they were less fearful of a Minaret as a threat to them than in those places where they didn't have a Muslim community. In my work on anti-Semitism, I'm finding that the actually, the, the deep-seated antipathy, the anti-Semitism is more deep-seated in those countries where people have less chance of meeting Jewish people than when they have a chance to meet with them. So of course, knowledge, you know, dissolves prejudice. And that's, that's one element of this. The other, of course, is the importance of literacy about human rights, to let people know what their rights are, literacy about their own religion, so they can actually practice their faith they're having to abandon their faith. This is also, also empowering because without that, they have to rely in the Muslim context on dialing up or in this, in this day and age, sending a, a WhatsApp text to a mullah and getting get their response, but they can themselves explore their faith and be able to contribute to it as well. As a, as a little anecdote here, you know, while Maldives is right, rightly notorious for being a very liberal state in religious freedom, the world's foremost voice on this subject on freedom comes from, from Maldives. Abdullah Saeed, a professor at Melbourne University, is perhaps the world's leading voice on arguing that Islam doesn't have a penalty and apostasy and therefore these laws are not valid. Or against uh, blasphemy, again, the, against demonst again demonstrating the provenance of these laws um, is political, so making the case to, to repeal them. But why isn't he able to be in the Maldives? Because of course, like you said, the, rule, you know, the other freedoms aren't there. So if you had other freedoms of expression, of association, of intellectual freedom, then you have a much better, much better chance of promoting diversity and respect for you know, others' rights than if you didn't have them. So that's why I think the educational environment is so important. And not just education from a teacher to a student, that may work, but not so well, as peer-to-peer -peer learning. Peer-to-peer -peer empathy-based learning can create more self-reflective citizens who can then, of course, you know, deal with these diverse challenges of, of a globalizing world where you know, we're all facing change all the time. And if you didn't, if you weren't prepared to embrace diversity, you become very afraid. And the, the person who's frightened is far more vulnerable to a hateful reaction than someone who is perhaps more intellectually you know, aware of the, of, the, of the change and difference around the world. Well, I think you said it beautifully. We, we often talk about the idea of pluralism within our, uh, within our work, and it, it can be a misunderstood term, but you know, pluralism, the way we define it is this active engagement with people who are different than you, um, different beliefs, different cultures, different, uh, you know, ways of life and perspectives. And so that's really what you described is, can we actively engage with others? Do we understand the other? Are we, you know, if we're in isolation, I remember being, I think it was in Lebanon and some of the teachers that we worked with there said, everything's great in, in Lebanon, we're all, we all have our separate communities and we all treat each other with respect. And after they went through our training, they realized that that, that was okay, but it wasn't really the highest form of, of pluralism that they could achieve, that, that a, a higher form or truer form of pluralism is when you don't just, aren't just isolated and separated from one, one another and say, well, you can exist and you can have your rights over there. And you know, we, we get along, we're happy, but you know, we're all in our separate spaces. It's actually when you can actively engage with one another, live side by side, and 
and you, you, you can exist in the same space uh, and not have to feel isolated or separated from one another and have that level of respect for the differences that you each have. We, we also found that it's often that um, when people come into our programs, there's this fear that, that they will have to change their religion or beliefs or that they'll, that they'll to, become, to become more pluralistic, they have to lose part of themselves. And I think you said it very well that what we've seen from the people that have come out of our program, whether they're Sunni, Shia, Christian, Yazidi, Zoroastrian, atheist, whatever, is that they feel more com comfortable and confident in themselves and their own beliefs, which you shared more aware of the other, but also more aware of yourself. And the self-awareness is so important because most, you know, religion and belief is such an important part of who we are as human beings. And it, right. it orients our life. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect it to be just a minuscule part of somebody's life that they can just, you know, brush aside, you know, in order to get along with everyone. It's an important part of themselves. And so it's going to be expressed in everything that they live and do and, and their, their attitudes and beliefs, and that should be okay. And so I don't want to diminish that at all in our trainings. We want people to find ways that they can feel confident in who they are and yet be side by side with somebody that might have a very different belief and perspective, whose ideas and perspectives might be in conflict with one another, but who can respect the space to be there together. And that's ultimately what we've been trying to create in the programs that we do within education, but it really sounds exactly like what you were describing. Yeah, what I said earlier about active acceptance is so important. That is the operative phrase here, active acceptance of, of the other. Uh, and of course, you know, I come across many toleration mindsets, like you said in Lebanon. Yeah, we live here, they live there, we're happy, they're happy, you know, we don't mind them, they don't mind us. You know, that model doesn't work in the 21st century uh, because we have to in intermingle. And there are two things I say to people. I, re I refer to Amartya Sen, who speaks about individuals having multiple identities. You can be, but you say, in my case, I'm Muslim. I can, I can be Muslim, I can be a teacher, I can be a father, I am a father, I'm a husband, you know, and I'm a, I can go shopping, all these things. So in all these diff different identities, we exist in one person. And we should relate to others in that multiple complex way. At the same time, also actively accept that others can be different to you and that that's just fine. And that's the difference between, I suppose, tolerance and pluralism, being able to really, really, really embrace that. The other example I cite uh, to others is Albania. You have three communities. You have the, uh, the Catholic community, the Muslim community, and the Orthodox community. They may broadly occupy three different parts of the state, but for the Albanians, it's Albanian that, might be, that matters. Of course, for them, faith is important as well. They are important, but it's multiple identities, and therefore they interact regardless of, of who you are. As, a, as compared to other states, example, Sri Lanka, where there is a massive rise in what I call territorialism of, of, of the religion. So some people believe this road is Hindu, this road is Buddhist, this road is Catholic. And if anybody else comes and plants any of their symbols there, oh, that's, you know, a catastrophe for them. This notion of breaking free of territorial attachments to religion as, and shifting that to an individual attachment, of course they can have collective uh, you know, worship and so on, but recognize that others have an equal right as you are to be who they are in any place they want to be, so long as you can also be peacefully who you are in wherever you want to be. That's pluralism, right? So I think inculcating those values of accepting the other in all their diversity in an active form is so crucial. I think education should contribute to that. And I'm very happy to hear about your work in Lebanon as well doing, doing that. I hope more would do this because that is crucial. Of course, we should focus on the present generation of so adults uh, we're working with. Same time, we will not be able to secure the future unless we begin to work at the grassroots with, with young children, look at the curriculum, the school textbooks, see what, 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 is, what is in this. In many countries, far too many countries, I find textbooks actually become you know, uh, the actual, if you like, you know, um, co co container of um, stereotypes and hatred towards others that then multiplies as, as they go along over time. Which, which really brings us to this, the next idea, which is the importance of overcoming those misperceptions. And you talked about it when you're actively engaging with one another, 
you can overcome them. I, we have a, an example in Iraq when we first, most of our trainings when we first started were legal trainings and helping to deal with constitutional and legal provisions that needed to be reformed and helping local leaders with that. But then we began to move more into education. Actually, before I went to Essex, I was a school teacher. So I taught uh, junior high or middle school and high school. And I taught human rights in schools, but also taught US history as well. And I just, um, so, so it's fun to come back to that. So now much of our work is in the educational space. And in Iraq, we, we teach using analogies because religion is often a difficult concept. And so, you know, when we talk about abstract things like fruit and we say, you know, look, we're all fruit, it's easier than saying, you know, we're all Hindus, Muslims, Christians, mm -hmm. but you know, we're all the same. So we just talk about fruit. We feel like it's an easier place to go uh, to help people really take down the, the barriers that they have in talking about a difficult concept. And in that conversation, then they can explore all of the different reasons why your, your, um, your beliefs really shape and form how you live and, and your, your views of life and death and et cetera, and why that's so important to every human and how you can exist in the same space and be respectful of another person who has that. And so anyway, these teachers, these Yazidis that had escaped from ISIS uh, that were in our training developed their own analogy to teach children in the refugee camps using the, gar the idea of a garden. And so they took all their kids to a garden and they said, now go and make these bouquets of flowers. So the kids did, and they said, just don't use this one color. I think it was like yellow. So the kids went and they made beautiful bouquets of flowers and they came back and the teacher said, oh, they're so beautiful, but look back at the garden. And so when the students looked back, they realized that they had totally destroyed the garden because they just ransacked it. They pulled everything that they wanted, but left you know, these scraggly like little yellow flowers all over. And the teacher said, this is what happened when ISIS came in. They did, they destroyed everyone except for the people that looked and believed like them. And those refugees were Muslim. They were Christian. They were Yazidi. They were Kakai. They were Shabak. They were Zoroastrian. They were Baha'i. And they looked at each other and they were all really sad because they realized what had happened. And they realized um, that they were, they had happened to all of them, not just one of them. And so then the teacher gave them a packet of seeds and said, would you prefer to be in this, the garden to look like this or like the, the other one? They said, no, we want it to look beautiful again. So they worked and they, they planted the garden again and, and it was beautiful and it grew and it, they all came back and the teacher said, you know, what have you learned? And this one Yazidi boy said, well, I thought all Muslims were like ISIS. And then I realized that he escaped just like me. And I think it was such an important moment for them to realize that, you know, so many misperceptions and bias and fear that had fueled their fear and their hatred of one another. And that could have fueled another generation of conflict. They were able to recognize and overcome and then say, we don't want to live that way. We want to plant the seeds of peace for our future because now we know that there's hope for us to actually live together and not to be stuck in that cycle of conflict. And that's really the power of education. It's the power of education at all ages and levels that we've seen around the world from Iraq to Lebanon to our own country and many others. And so, you know, as I've been talking to so many um, leaders from different countries last year, actually right before COVID hit, the King of Morocco hosted us uh, and we hosted with ministers of education from around the region to talk about this model and how important education is. And they really bought into it and they bought into it not because we were trying to change them in any way. It was because whatever analogy they wanna use for this freedom, create your own analogy but let it be your own and help create a space where people can live side by side with differences of opinions and beliefs and other things, but that they're not living in fear of one another with those misperceptions. And so it really gets back to everything you were saying, but I, um, I, I'm so encouraged by what we're seeing in the world because education really is the future. That's so insightful and so beautiful, you know, the analogy you just described. I mean, I mean, I mean that's so good. I mean, it's an active form of learning, right? Where young people discover themselves experientially as it were, but, but you know, why diversity is so important and why living together is so important. As I'm saying, this is, far, is a far better way of learning than having a teacher drill ideas in, into them about what is pluralism and what, what, what is not. That's a beautiful, beautiful, if you like, you know, uh, experience you just described. 
Thank you. I, I want to go back to something else you were sharing. You talked a little bit about um, the some of the misperceptions of the Jewish community and how you were able to overcome them. And I know there are a lot of drivers of, of, of hate, a lot of fears that drive a drive violence against different communities. But in particular, when we look at the Jewish community, because uh, disproportionately they face more uh, you know, attacks and just restrictions and discrimination based on their faith than any other community. Can you talk about that a little bit and some of the, the hatred and fear that's, that's fueling that? Well, you know, um, I've called it the oldest form of hatred, you know, uh, religious hatred around the world. I've called it the canary in the coal mine because it's often the first uh, to be detected. And then of course, pretty soon after that, others fall in, in the terrain. Um, it's hard to explain why, apart from the fact that it's so widespread. You know, it's, I think it's the fact that it's the oldest and so widespread just keeps on replicating itself in new forms all the time. And what is really shocking is, is the way in which it met metamorphoses itself into new forms. So we now talk about even contemporary forms of anti-Semitism, a lot of it linked to, of course, the Middle Eastern politics, but very virulent. As you said, as you said, I also observed when I came onto the mandate that not only were anti-Semitic attacks perhaps the most frequent attacks, but they were also almost invariably very violent. Um, and that's a cause of concern. And of course, if you look at the, the total community, six, some 16 million around the world, and in that context, there's such a disproportionate impact, if it, as it were, you know, on, on the community. And then if you look at the way, you know, people experience this, young children going to school that looks like uh, prisons, for example, you know, that's in itself a pretty nasty experience. And of course, the kind of abuse they face on the way to school and so on and so forth, you know, that's just not a way for someone to anyone to live. And again, what is so disturbing is the ease with which any crisis, any anxiety gets blamed um, on, on Jews. Because at the heart of anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory that Jews are at one time, at the same time, so powerful they can do anything, same time so weak we can attack them. So it, it's, it's a kind of, you know, very strange sense of duality. What is dri driving it? I think a lot of factors. One, of course, I would say at the present time, I think, um, you know, powerful politicians, they can have a, again, a very high impact, high velocity impact on their communities because they have the pulpit, they have the, they feel like the outreach and they can incite, you know, violence hatred towards others. And we've been seeing a lot of that uh, from many countries, you know, powerful leaders in times of difficulty falling back on as an excuse, excuse you know, scapegoating uh, Jewish communities. And that has a very long lasting impact. At the same time, they have the education-based, you know, uh, the deep anti-Semitism. In the Muslim world, for example, you have radical Muslim, you know, clerics and others using the pulpit, using school system to preach hatred towards Jews, if, even in, invoking, you know, uh, scriptural sources, uh, in my view, distorting them to create that kind of impression on young, young people. And then, of course, you have the, the, the political context in terms of the growing surge in right-wing politics in, in many uh, countries. And you know, for the, for the right-wing uh, communities, they take a negative approach. And for them, the Jewish communities still are an alien group. So the, so the xeno-racism that comes into this um, is again a, a factor. And so it's so a, a wide range of factors. I, was, I would also add the fact that lack of awareness about what anti-Semitism is, lack of awareness about the different forms it takes, um, and of course, um, the, the ease with which people can carry out the impunity for these attacks are, I think, primary drivers. Of course, one must also add the online you know, di uh, uh, dimension now. I think in the past decade or so, a couple of decades perhaps, the online world has really increased the, the speed with which hate mongers can, can disseminate their hate. So we've seen attacks are taking place in the US in, in other places as well many of which I think inspired by online, uh, you know, uh, uh, incitement to violence and hatred towards Jews. So really it, it shows the dark side, I think, of politics, dark side of human nature. And as I said, in my report, in a country, any country where anti-Semitism goes un un unchecked, it represents not just a dis deep dysfunctional society, but it bodes ill society as a whole, because, you know, it, it just creates distrust, it creates hatred, it doesn't enable society to have the resource required to be a cohesive society that requires resilience and cohesion for them to you know, prosper together. Well, and like you said, it's the canary in the coal mine for so many other uh, groups that 
for really a, a, a slippery, it's a slippery slope downwards where you see that that's the first thing that's attacked and then so many other freedoms and groups are attacked. Um, but, but there is this surge in attacks and anti-Semitic attacks worldwide and a lot of it's politically motivated, but I mean, it's growing in many of the Western countries, isn't it? It is indeed. And again, you know, there are multiple, I think, causes for this. And there's also, you know, something I should have said earlier, that some of the migrant groups in the Middle East, uh, when they have come across to, I mean, of course, only elements within, you can't, you know, blame the entire communities for this. Elements within these, uh, you know, groups have also brought in, uh, I think, anti-Semitic ideas from, from their kind of origin. Again, in these societies too, it's, I think, quite of recent origin. It probably dates back the last hundred years. Some of it, I think, the the, the notion of the protocol of the elders of the of the of, of Zion, you know, a book that goes back about hundred years or so, you know, a forged book, that probably created a lot, a lot of anti-Semitism in the Middle East. Now that has come back uh, to Western societies in the form of you know the online dimension or people coming in, and that also adds on uh, to to this to this dimension. But I think for the most part, it's also uh, the 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 growth of hatred, um, you know, lack of respect for diversity, the intolerance. All of that also feeds in to this uh, of you know, targeting of, of Jews as well other, others as, as well. So I think it's a combination of factors, both migration, both the globalization and internet if the communication speed, as well as I think political leaders. I should also add one more dimension here: the role of the media. You know, we've gone from the public broadcasting format to a kind of free commercial-led media, and this has a capacity or a tendency to self-perpetuate its own bubble as it were, catering to its own audience, its own market. And that market increasingly becomes a very narrow market, intolerant market. So they, they keep on repeating that, as opposed to public broadcasting systems, which can, which to, used to bring in a multiplicity of views, a diversity of views to, to be heard. So when people are not heard, then you, you, know, you have the narrow views of people emerging. And one of the things, again, what hate speech does is, further narrow the scope for speech. Hate speech actually diminishes freedom of expression because it, it, it drives other people out of if you like, the, the, the space for, for speaking. So all of this combined is creating a very intolerant world. We saw in the pandemic, it began, uh, I think with attacking Asian communities, quickly uh, took up the anti-Semitic overtones and then it just went on from there after any other community where they can find them in a minority. So it is a combination of all these factors together. Well, in kind of switching a little bit from that, but building upon what you, your last comment, uh, we often see ethnic and religious communities used as scapegoats. And obviously during the pandemic, we saw an uptick in Asian, in violence against Asian Asians. Um, but what, what else are you seeing in that space as far as communities and groups being scapegoated and used by governments and how can we how can we confront that and really challenge it? Because so often these smaller groups, whether they be Jewish or Asian or whoever they, they might be, are, are blamed for different things. And, um, it, you know, it's used, I mean, how can we combat that? Well, in the pandemic has raised anxiety levels all over the world for everybody, you know, because of the pandemic of its effect on the health, but also its economic effect as well. And that's one dimension, just, just fear of something you know, uh, that, that drives them to find a scapegoat. And of course, always you find the softest target as your scapegoat, because you obviously can't you know, um, you know, take on stronger people. So that is one dimension, you know, finding a scapegoat. And we've seen that in almost every context, it is whoever is in a minority that has faced the brunt of this, of this, of this anxiety. The second, of course, um, is the willful manipulation of the more constrained space and less space for human rights by elements for their own agenda. So we've seen political targeting of groups, uh, you know, uh, say in Pakistan, for example, you know, despite the lockdown, despite the constraints of movement, has been a sharp increase in, in persecution or harassment of the Ahmadis, a traditional foe for the majoritarian community there. But the pandemic gave them a cover to raise up, if you like, you know, their, their, their intolerance. Also, in some states, in some cases, in some cases, in the distribution of supplies, relief supplies, food, even health uh, services, there's been discrimination that have affected the minorities. So we're seeing, we're seeing the use of the pandemic, the fears, 
to target some communities suffer some further. In Sri Lanka, we have had to speak on several occasions uh, during the pandemic because the government's policy of forced cremations, um, you know, uh, wasn't necessary by public health standards, but it comes back on a policy we've seen in recent times in, in Sri Lanka of targeting the Muslim community and other minorities. So governments have used the, the, the pandemic and the increased powers they have got to, to distort public policy in ways that privilege the majority undermine rights of minority. Same time, the, the you know, civil society actors themselves, non-state actors themselves, have used the same space of restrict, restricted movement, restricted uh, space uh, public scrutiny to target uh, communities that they don't like. So overall, there's been a pretty bad time for those in a minority, including, of course, women um, and uh, gender and minorities who find lockdown to be very, very, if you like, suffocating, as well as dissenters in religion, the, you know, the, the, the uh, progressive Muslims, um, you know, converts and so on and so forth. Now they're locked in communities or in homes where the home itself may be safe for them. So all of this, you know, creates a lot of vulnerability for those who are in a weaker position compared to those who have access to better resources and perhaps, you know, benefit from established privileges in society. We've definitely seen in the last year with the pandemic, uh, the lack of understanding of this particular area of human rights. That, that certain countries can simply discount the need that individuals have to worship um, or take it as lightly, you know, as just saying, well, you can't go and you can't, you can't pray during Ramadan, you can't pray during Easter, you can't, you know, congregate, you can't take communion, you can't, I mean, so many restrictions that really denied people their ability to find hope in the midst of a difficult time it really showed me how little literacy there is about the importance of, of, um, of a, spirit, a spiritual uh, worship of, of religion with, and belief within a person. Uh, and it's universal, it's all over the world. And yet how so many governments were able to just like say, well, let's just put that on pause. It really exposed to me the lack of understanding of this human right. Like you were saying when we first started, so many people think it's just about imposing religion. It has nothing to do with teaching religion or imposing religion, but it, it is about understanding how important that dimension is to human life and allowing its expression. And that seems to be where a lot of governments around the world just don't understand or respect the fact that this is such an important aspect of human expression. Have you seen that? And what is your kind of, how have you kind of seen that play out in the midst of this pandemic? Right, you know, there's a, there is a range of, if you like, state religion relationships around the world. Um, in some cases, there's a very strong tie between religion and state. And in those cases, it often is one religion that is embraced by state and others suffer on account of that. At the other extreme, you have governments that are hostile to religion altogether, like the China and the, you know, the more militant secular states for them. Any excuse to suppress you know, worship is, is a welcome sign for them. But in between our states, which either cooperate with the communities and they have by and large have been better able to understand the need for spiritual you know, pastoral care and been able to accommodate that so far as possible within reasonable limitations for public health concerns. But others generally tend to be agnostic of what, how, how important this is for people. And therefore they don't really understand the burden they impose on on, on the limitations they, they impose on, on, on public health grounds, even when they could have permitted within public health safety standards, some form, some form of you know, assembly. I think over time, there's been little sort of, you know, uh, walk back from these intolerant policies to some sort of accommodation. But by and large, the first instinct was, okay, we have a pandemic, so we're gonna impose a uniform, uniform lockdown on everybody, regardless of the burden it imposed on everybody and how proportional it was in regard to the public health concerns that, that were raised. But subsequently, of course, I think there were some accommodation adjustments which enabled many communities to have some form of pastoral care or some form of worship within, within if you like, social distancing rules as one has said. Well, and that's why your role and just the role of the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief is so important because in times of crisis, that's when we have our rights, that they should be protected. It's not when they should be taken away. I mean, we, we have them so that, and we often take them for granted in times of ease, but it's in times of crisis where we have to remember, no, we have rights, we have to protect them. I mean, that was the whole 
point of the universal human rights movement uh, was that they're not they're not to be just thrown away uh, in the time of crisis. And like you said, there's a burden that is on the government. Is this necessary? If you if you restrict these freedoms, is it proportionate? And all of these words that you're saying are so important for people to understand and to have somebody in the world that's reminding governments, hey, governments, you can't just you can't just restrict the entire freedom. You can't just say, well, let's just put this on hold. We're in crisis. Um, it's so important because you're really ensuring the protection of people from the power of their government. And that's it's you know it's whether you call it a watchdog or whatever you want to call it it's an invaluable position because you're really standing out for all of those little people everywhere in the world that don't have a voice whose governments might not care who might be minorities and regardless of what faith they are because in every country there's a minority that's different from the next uh, they need that voice to to stand up for them so Ahmed, thank you for everything that you're doing and for being that for so long now. I mean, it's uh, you have another year and a half, I guess, left of your mandate. And I, I think we, you know, for such a time as this, we've needed you here. So thank you for your leadership. Well, thank you, Tina. Actually, you know, uh, I mean, I find in this space a growing number of voices like, like yourself, for example, working, you know, at the grassroots, working on the ground with, with real people, making sure people understand better how, how diverse the world is, making people understand what FOB is, is how, what this right is, and creating the nuanced understanding enables all of us at times of stress to find something with which we can work on. So I think it's, a, I mean, I find in the time I spend this mandate, a growing number of countries, a number of actors have come into space and all of course recognizing how important this is as a space to work on. And of course, you know, being able to, I think, pull together, work together. I want to point out the, Great work done by various faith leaders in the pandemic of the past year, uh, you know, including through the um, uh, World Religions Association, a regularly meeting with the UN, UN system, other act, uh, actors to look at what can be done. And it's fascinating to see the amount of work they do, both in terms of charitable care and humanitarian intervention in cases, but also spiritual, if you like, uh, care uh, when the need arises, as well as working together in multi faith groups to demonstrate that, you know, we are all in the same boat here. The ship goes down, we all go down. And that's, I think, a very important message that we all need to be conveying. Well, I think you're right on that. It's a rising tide lifts all boats and <laughs> one ship sinks, we all sink. So I don't, for people to understand, we've got to come together. And that's really, it's not about coming together to sing Kumbaya. It's about coming together to respect the differences that we have and the deep beliefs that we have that might be different, but that, you know, it's what makes us human. And so... Uh, it's really fundamental, but I'm so excited that we had this time together. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing many more future reports and uh, I, things that you have to share about the successes that, you know, that, we, that we're seeing. Now, thank you so much, Tina, for inviting me to come and have a chat. It's been very, it's been a very, if you like, you know, learning experience for me as well to hear about your own work and to hear about the great, the great, if you like, experience you are having with, with, you know, various um, if you like students and others in various parts of the world, from Iraq to, to Lebanon and elsewhere. The key thing is to be, be able to speak to practitioners like yourself and learn from them. Thank you so much.